Well, good morning, Salem Chapel. It's good to be with you again. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. If you're a regular or a member of Salem Chapel, I wish I could see your face right now. I know you can see mine, and I know that we're going to have a great time diving into God's Word this morning. We've already had a tremendous time worshiping Him with music and praying to Him. So I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27. If you are new with us, we are in this series. We took a break for Easter, uh, which was last week, but we've been walking through Psalm 27 in this series, Heart of a Lion, looking at how we can live courageously in a chaotic world, which is what we're experiencing right now. And God's word has the answer for us and how we can live courageously in a chaotic world, how we can have a heart of a lion. We put out a challenge at the beginning of this series that we wanted to have as a goal for you and me to have this entire Psalm, Psalm 27 memorized. And we've just been working through it week by week. You had an off week last week because we were in a different passage of scripture. So if you're behind, you have time uh, to catch up. I want to encourage you to memorize this. Listen, I'm not selling something here. This isn't an infomercial, uh, but I know how much your heart will benefit from bringing these verses into your life and into your memory to recite back, to preach back to those fears, discouragement, uh, emotions that you will feel not only in this time, but after we're out of this uh, coronavirus uh, experience that we are all in, these verses will be verses that you will be able to use in a myriad of different ways. So memorize them. Don't allow yourself to fall behind. So Psalm 27, uh, I'm going to start in verse 1, and uh, I'm going to uh, recite verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to dive into verse 5. So verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Verse five says this, this is where we're going to be this morning. For he, who's he? The Lord. For he, the Lord, will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Let me give you the definition of what we mean by heart of a lion. As we walk through this verse this morning and as we continue to walk through this psalm, a heart of a lion, as we've defined it, is this. Living with a courageous confidence in the character and competency of the Lord in all, in every circumstance. That's what the Lord desires us to have. That heart of a lion. And verse 5 has that same idea of living with this courageous confidence in the character and competency of the Lord in all circumstance. So if you're taking notes today, here's the title of the message, The Lord, and if you're writing that, capital L-O-R-D is the name that that David uses in this psalm. The Lord is always working. Not sometimes, not every once in a while. The Lord is always working. Here's the idea that I want us to get from this one verse today. Just looking at one verse, but this one verse has so much in it. Here's the idea. A heart of a lion has a courageous confidence that God is always working in the chaos. That a heart of a lion has a courageous confidence. That's coming from our definition that the God, that the Lord, L-O-R-D, is always working in the chaos. Look at what David says in verse five. He says, it says, he will. He says that over and over again in this verse, and you ought to underline that. Whenever you're reading God's word and you see a phrase repeated over and over again, uh, it's there for a purpose. The Lord is wanting you to get this. And so I encourage you to underline, he will every time you see it. But he says, he will what? In the day of trouble, in the midst of your chaos. In this verse, 
at one of the darkest times in David's life. Remember, David, most scholars believe, is running from King Saul. King Saul is trying to kill David. He's running from cave to cave there in the, in the desert in Israel. It's one of the darkest times in David's life. But I love what he does in verse 5, because in verse 5, what he does is he lists the promises of God's protection that come from him being in relationship with God and living in his presence. So David is literally going to rehearse what God promises for him in the midst of his chaos. And it really reminds me of this, that without God, without the Lord, you, me, we have nothing of eternal value or eternal hope. Nothing. John 15, 15, Jesus says this, without me, you can do nothing. But listen to me, when you have God, when you have the Lord in your life, you have everything. You have everything that truly lasts, that truly brings satisfaction. And don't forget that during this time when, when things may be being removed from you or taken away from you, or you're afraid of losing some things, that if you have a relationship with God, that you have everything that truly lasts and brings satisfaction. And that's what David is doing right now when he's away from home, he's away from family that he loves, he's running for his life, he doesn't know if he's gonna die today. Look at the three words of protection in this verse, in verse five, that emphasizes the complete care of our Lord. It says, God will hide me. God will conceal me. God will lift me. You see those three phrases there. And when will the Lord do this? Here's what I love. When does David say the Lord will do this? He says he will do this in the day. That word day literally means time. In the time of trouble, that needy time, that desperate time, those fearful times, those discouraging times. Listen to me, if that's what you're feeling right now, what I want you to understand is the Lord is always working and he does his best work in the day, in the time of trouble. So I wanna give you three things in this verse, three things that the Lord promises to do in your chaos. The first one is this. He promises, the Lord promised, promises the safest shelter in the worst of danger. That's what the Lord promises you. The safest shelter in the worst of danger. Look what he says. He says, he will hide me in his shelter. That word shelter means safe place. What time? In the day, in the time of trouble. Now, there's a picture on your screen of, of an ancient camp, an ancient army camp. And here's why I have that being shown on your screen right now is because a king during these ancient times, and really it carried through regardless of what nation you were with, a king would set up his shelter or tent in the center of the army camp so that Around his shelter would be the mightiest of men, the, the highest ranking men, the, the greatest uh, fighters would be around that king's tent. David knew this. David was a warrior. David had fought in battles. David had seen King Saul fought, fight in battles. And so that's what would take place is the king would have in the center of the camp where he abode. And David knew this, and it's why he makes this analogy in regard to the Lord's protection of him. He says, hey, in the time of trouble, the king, the Lord, Yahweh, the self-existent, self-sufficient one that promises to be with me, he's going to invite me to dwell in his tent with him, to be in his presence. It's interesting when you look at the Old Testament when the children of Israel were, were wandering around in the wilderness and, and even after they got into the promised land, they, they had a tabernacle and they would have to set up that tabernacle and take it down when they would journey. And it's interesting that in the Old Testament in Numbers that God instructs Israel when they set up this tabernacle to set it up where? In the middle of the camp. Because God wanted his people to know, I am right in the middle of your camp. I am with 
you. And what does David run to in the midst of the trouble that he is experiencing? He runs to, he trusts in, he looks to the Lord for his safest shelter in the midst of danger. He says, Lord, I'm going to run to your power. Lord, I'm going to run to your protection. Lord, I'm going to look to you for my provision. I love what Proverbs 18.10 says. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Don't lose sight of this. And this is why context is so important when you're reading God's word. David is running for his life. Every day, he doesn't know if it's going to be his last But David understands that the Lord was using this time of trouble in David's life to prepare him for something greater in his future. And let's not be, let's not you, let not me be short-sighted that the Lord isn't using this time of trouble that we are in. Whether you have contracted the coronavirus and you're watching this or, or whether you, you are afraid of losing your job or you've lost your job or, or whatever, whatever you're afraid of losing or have lost, don't be short sighted in thinking that the Lord isn't using this time of trouble in our lives to prepare you, to prepare me for something greater that lies ahead of us. The Lord has removed everything else from David's life right now. He's removed his family. He's he's removed whatever whatever, uh, home he's been in. He's removed all of these things from David's life. And now he's in a desert with next to nothing. And what David could have looked to for shelter, God has removed. Why? So that David could have greater clarity that the Lord is the safest shelter in the worst of danger. And listen to me. I know for a fact, because I believe what it's what the Lord wants me to know, and I know it's what he wants you to know, regardless of the circumstances that you may be experiencing that are different than me, that the Lord is using this time to show you that during this shelter in place order, that the Lord is your safest shelter. Did you get that? Don't lose sight of that. Don't miss the opportunity for the Lord to grow that in you. How are you reminding yourself of that today? You can be watching this right now, live streaming it right now. You can be watching it right now. You may be watching it later, uh, Sunday afternoon. You may be watching it during the week. But how are you reminding yourself of that today? Are you running to and resting in the Lord's shelter Knowing that the Lord's saying, hey, I want you to come. I want you to dwell with me. I want you to experience my presence. I'm inviting you into my tent. It's the safest place that you can dwell. But listen to me, it takes initiative on your part. The Lord can extend the invitation, but you have to accept it. And one of the ways, listen to me, one of the ways why I want you to memorize Psalm 27 is so that you can experience this in a greater way, so that you can recite these verses back to you when you're wanting to run from the Lord's shelter and you're like, no, 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 I need to remind myself. I need to run to the Lord's shelter. What do I recall back in my mind to remind me of that? Psalm 27. There is a tremendous app that somebody turned me on to. Listen, I'm not getting any money for this, trust me. But it's called the Verses app. If you have trouble memorizing scripture, it's a great app that you can download on your phone. It's free and it literally has ways to help you memorize scripture. Don't say, I can't do that. Press into this right now. Press into the Lord's shelter, memorize scripture. Be in his word daily. The first thing that the Lord promises to do in our chaos is number one, he promises the safest shelter in the worst of danger. Here's the second thing that God promises. He promises the deepest relationship in the worst of danger. Look at what David says again. He says, in the day of trouble, what will the Lord do? He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. Now, what I think is interesting is, is in the New King James Version, here's how it translates this this phrase in verse five. The New King James Version says this, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. 
David once again is making an analogy to the tabernacle because that's what David would have been familiar with when he thinks about God's presence. So what was the tabernacle? I mentioned it already, but it was this mobile sanctuary, because some of you may not know, it was this mobile sanctuary of worship for the people of Israel. And like I said, it was set up in the middle of the camp, but it was set apart. It was seen as holy for worship of the Lord and for sacrifices. They would make sacrifices to remind them that they could not cover or pay for their own sin. And this tabernacle was separated into three areas. You had the outer court, you had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place, or maybe some of us might know it as the holy of holies. It was a picture of what's inside of this tabernacle. And priests and Levites, who would be the ones to minister, would minister in the outer court. They would minister with the people there as they offered sacrifices for sin and guilt. But in the center of the outer court, there was a tent that only the priests could enter. No one else could go into the tent part, into the holy place. And there were three articles of furniture in this holy place. There was the golden lampstand. And that was to, to burn continually. It never was supposed to go out and it gave light to the holy place. And then you had this table of showbread and this, this bread was baked fresh every day, never went stale. And only the priests were allowed to eat of it. Nobody else could say, hey, uh, hey, priest, I'm hungry. Can you go in there and get some showbread and bring it out to me? No, no, no. Only the priests could eat it. And then you had this altar of incense. And it was, it was the priest would go in and he would burn this incense. It was this special incense that was burned each morning and each evening as an offering to the Lord. But it was also a reminder to the people of God's presence as they saw that incense go up. Now, the last place was the whole, was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. It was at the back of this tent and it was a smaller chamber and it was separated with this veil and the veil we're told in in the old testament was three inches thick and this in this smaller room was held the ark of the covenant the most precious thing to the people of israel because it symbolized the presence and power of god with his people then you had on top of this ark, there was a special area on top of this ark between the cherub's wings called the mercy seat. And this was seen as the throne of God. So you had this holy of holies, but here's how the holy of holies was different from the holy place. See, priests could enter the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the holy of holies and he could only do it one day a year on the day of atonement and when he would go in he would go in with a blood sacrifice and he would go in with that incense and that incense would be burning and he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on that mercy seat to atone to symbolize forgiveness for the people of Israel but if anyone was to enter that most holy place, the holy of holies, outside of the high priest, they would be killed. And if the high priest entered into that space on any other day, but the day of atonement once a year, he would be killed. See, the tabernacle emphasized the presence of God in the midst of his people. And what David is trusting is that his relationship with God is his greatest protection. I mean, God's basically almost removed everything else from him. He has a few uh, guys that are with him as he's running from cave to cave. But David, more than anything else, more than trusting in his compadres who are with him, more than trusting in his skills with a slingshot or with a sword, he's going back to his relationship with God when he says, in the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. And what he's saying there and the analogy that he's using of the tabernacle, what it's saying is because God is hiding him in that place, he's bringing him into a place that's so sacred that no one would dare enter in because they would be afraid of death. Now, let's take this analogy because you're like, well, Johnny, what's the point? So let's take that analogy that David uses of the tabernacle and let's think of where we are today. Let's think about that holy place and what was in it. So you have that golden lampstand, right? 
that was always supposed to be lit, was never supposed to be out, that would give light to the holy place. Well, what does Jesus say of himself in the New Testament? He says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light. Jesus calls himself the light of the world. He's speaking primarily to Jews. And so they would have, they would have begun to make the connection there. Think about the table of showbread and how it was to feed the priest. What does Jesus call himself? He calls himself the bread of life. John 6, 34, he says, I'm the bread of life. He says, he who comes to me shall not hunger. Speaking of spiritually hunger. Think about the altar of incense, right? That was to symbolize the presence of God. Well, what did Jesus provide for us through his life, death, and resurrection? He provided us with the ability to enjoy God's presence. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, we are the aroma of Christ to God. Now, finally, think of the Holy of Holies. Remember, it was separated by that three-inch thick veil. And if you went in at the wrong time, or if you were the wrong person to go in there, you were dead. God was getting across that I'm perfect, man, it is sinful. There is payment for your sin, it's death. God was getting across his holiness. But what happened when Jesus died on the cross? You can go to Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15, 38, Luke 23, 45, and it says when Jesus says it is finished, what happens? It says that veil was ripped in two, but what I love is every passage emphasizes how it was ripped. It was not ripped from bottom to top. It was ripped from top to bottom. What was the significance of that? Is that because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and me through his perfect life, perfect death, and resurrection, that if I put my trace trust in what Jesus Christ has done for me, I can have a relationship with God. No longer do I need to live in fear. No longer do I need to say, well, I, don't, I believe in God, but I'm scared to dwell with God. No, 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 no. Jesus provided us with the deepest of relationship with God. Something that David could not even experience. David could not go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus provided us with something that David didn't have. But what I love is, is what David does in this verse that really speaks to us today is David says, Lord, what, I, what I'm reminded that I need more than anything, what I'm reminding where my greatest hope lies, Lord, what I'm reminded of that's going to speak to my greatest fear is that I have deep relationship with you, that Lord, in that time of trouble, you are going to conceal me. You are going to bring me into a safe place. You're going to hide me under the cover of your tent. You are going to invite me into your tabernacle so that I can dwell with you. And the fulfillment of that is found in Jesus Christ. Listen to what Hebrews 10, 19 and through 22 says. This is what the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, brothers, we can also say sisters, since we have a confidence to enter the holy places. Remember, we just spent a significant time explaining that. We can have confidence to enter the holy places. Why well, can I have confidence to enter the quote unquote holy places? Because the people of Israel didn't have that confidence. They weren't about to walk in where they couldn't walk. Well, he says, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he's opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest, Jesus is our great priest over the house of God, what's our response? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Remember that analogy of what the high priest would do? He would sprinkle the blood on the altar, symbolizing forgiveness. Well, that's what Jesus did when he shed his blood. He caused my heart to be clean before a holy God, my life to be clean, that God sees me through what Jesus has done for me, not my sinfulness. He says, our bodies are washed with pure water. What an amazing passage of scripture to drive home the point that Jesus provides us with the deepest relationship to speak to our worst of dangers. Hebrews 4.16 says this, let us then with confidence. What's our definition of heart of a lion? It's to live with a courageous confidence in the character and competency of the Lord in all circumstances. What does Hebrews 4.16 says? Let us then with confidence, 
Let us then with a heart of a lion draw near to the throne of grace. Why? Because we know, we believe, we trust in, we look to that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need, time of trouble. Are you pressing into that relationship with Jesus Christ that has been provided to you by God? God wants you to talk to him right now. You've been venting to your wife, you've been venting to your husband, venting to your friends, venting to whoever it may be about the circumstances that you're experiencing right now. Let me ask you, have you vented to God? You're like, well, Johnny, I couldn't imagine doing that. No, no, no. God wants to hear your venting. Have you talked to him? Have you told him your deepest fears? Have you told him your worries? Have you, have you told him your hurts? Have you told him your disappointments? Have you told him your unfulfilled expectations? I know God's an all-knowing God and he already knows it, but there's something powerful. Trust me, I've experienced it. There's something powerful when I actually voice those out loud to the Lord because here's what I found. When I actually speak them out loud, I give the greatest opportunity for the Lord to speak to those fears, to those worries, to those disappointments, to those unfulfilled expectations. He wants us to experience the deep relationship. He wants us to grow in our relationship with him during this time so that your relationship will be deeper and greater and more robust and more intimate and more of substance than it was before this situation has occurred. Here's the last thing that the Lord promises to do in our chaos according to this verse. Look at what David says. He will lift me high upon a rock. He promises. This is the third thing. God promises, the Lord promises the greatest victories in the worst of dangers. I love that David ends this verse this way. Up to this point, it's like, Lord, I, I can run to you to hide. I can run to you for safety. Lord, you're going to conceal me. You're going to hide me. Now, now all of a sudden, he flips the script and he speaks of this, of this triumphant, conquering type of phrase. He says, here's what else I know. Here's what else I know the Lord's going to do. Here's why I know that God is working in the midst of my chaos. He will lift me high upon a rock. You know what that tells me? David has an understanding and a belief and a confidence that God is not finished with him yet. That God's not done yet. That this danger that he's experiencing running for his life is serving a purpose that it's a process that the Lord is walking him through. He knows that this painful process that he's in serves a greater purpose. David has that confidence or he wouldn't have written what he wrote. Charles Spurgeon, some of you may know him, others of you may not. He was called the Prince of Preachers. He's, he's one of the just people that I just think so much of when I I've read about his life and he pastored in the mid to late 1800s in London, England. His church was called New Park Street uh, Chapel and then it was later changed to Metropolitan Tabernacle, but he pastored this church for 38 years. I mean, just the picture of him, right? He looks like such a boss, right? <laughs> but here's what I think is interesting. When you read his life, you know what he suffered with tremendously was depression. He struggled with that greatly. And here's what Charles Spurgeon says about verse five, about this phrase that David says, he will lift me high upon a rock. He says, how blessed is the standing of the man whom God himself sets on high above his foes upon an impregnable rock, which can never be stormed. How awesome is the way that he says that? And the reason why I shared with you that he struggled with depression is because Charles Spurgeon knew what he needed to do in order to cause those fears and those discouragements and those thoughts that would weigh on him and come in like dark, heavy clouds. He learned what to preach to his soul. 
No, no, no. This time is dark. This, this time is scary. I'm living in the midst of chaos. Lord, I know who I need to run to. Lord, I know that you're who I need to press into in my relationship with you. But here's what I also know. God, you are doing something in the midst of this that is going to prepare me for something greater. You're going to lift me high upon a rock. And 1 Corinthians 3.11 says this, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 3.11? That the greatest foundation for our lives is not my job, is not what I get paid, is not the size of my house, is not whether or not I'm married, is not how many kids I have, is none of those things. What's in my 401k or what, or now what little is in my 401k? No, 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 no. What my life is built upon as a follower of Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ himself. He is my rock. And listen to me, here's what I've learned and here's what the Lord has taught me, is teaching me, and I know will continue to teach me in the future, is that it takes humility. It takes humility to admit that you need shelter. And you've been fighting against it you know, we've been doing this on screen for five weeks. And you've been, you've been up to this point, man. You've been fighting. You've been thinking, man, I got this. I got control of this. And it takes humility to admit, admit that you need shelter. And the Lord wants you to admit that. Because it's amazing when you admit it and you run to him, how he brings calm and peace to your soul. It takes humility to admit, man, I need deep relationship other than my spouse, other than my kids, other than my friends. I mean, I, I need deep relationship with the Lord. It takes humility that victory in our current situation is out of your control. It takes tremendous humility. First Peter 5, 6, and 7, Peter says it this way, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. And how do we humble ourselves? We cast all our anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Think about that. The Lord is literally saying, if this is me, he's saying, no, no, no. I want you to humble yourself under my mighty hand. I want you to admit that you need a shelter greater than yourself. I want you to admit that you need a relationship with me and press into that more than anything else. No, no, no. I need you to admit that I'm the one that's going to lift you high upon the rock, that I'm the one that's doing something greater. I, no, no, I'm going to place myself from over here under the mighty hand of God, understanding, no, 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 that hand, Lord, is not a threat. No, no, it provides shelter. It provides relationship. It provides provision and protection. I'm going to place myself under the mighty hand of God because here's what's awesome. At the proper time, listen to me. Yeah, we're all waiting. Is the president going to say something different or going to be able to get out of our homes? What's the governor going to say? What's the mayor going to say? No, no, no. Listen, God's in control. And at the proper time, the Lord will remove me from that protection and turn it into provision. And now his hand, rather than covering me in my time of trouble, when that trouble is lifted, he's now going to lift me up with that same hand. But we have to exercise humility. See, we can't get lifted up without first humbling ourselves. And I've been there. I have been there. I have fought against it. I have said, no, 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 I got this. I need to do this. I'm going to defend myself. Whatever it is, I've been there. I know how hard that is. But I can also say by God's grace, I've been on the other side to be able to see the way that the Lord has used those times when I've been under his hand to prepare me for the times when he's wanted to lift me up. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I mentioned this verse a couple of weeks ago, that the Lord Jesus stands at the door of your life and he knocks. Because for some of you, man, you, you know about the Lord, you know about Jesus, you even know about Psalm 27, you have maybe have even started memorizing it. But if you're honest with yourself, you're saying, I've never put my trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've been trying to do it on my own with a little bit of help with Jesus. But what the Lord wants, wants you to understand is, no, no, no. 
It's you humbling yourself. It's admitting that you're a sinner, that you can't do anything to have a relationship with God, that Jesus Christ provided the only way that you can have a relationship with him and a home in heaven one day. And the Lord says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Are you going to let him in? It says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that Jesus will come in and he will commune with you. He will have relationship with you. And I just want to pause right now. And I want to ask you that if that's you and you're like, man, I want to commit my life to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. For you just to pray this simple prayer after me. There's nothing magical in the prayer, but it's important. Romans 10, 9 says that I need to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. Pray this with me. Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I believe you lived a perfect life for me. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you rose again. And today I'm placing my trust and belief in you as my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that this morning or this afternoon or whenever you're watching this, I wanna encourage you with something. You have begun a relationship with God because you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And we would love nothing more. You can, if you're watching this on our website, there's a place for, for you to indicate that you committed your life to Christ. If you're not, there's a place, if you're watching this later, there's a place that you can email us, info at salemchapel.org. We would love to follow up with you to put some resources in your hand. But listen to me, for the rest of us, who have made that decision, who have that relationship with the Lord because of Jesus already, we need to hear this. Is that we always believe that we are in a vulnerable position when things are being removed from us, right? That's how we feel. Man, I'm vulnerable. I really wanted that and that was taken away or I'm afraid of losing this, whatever it is, and I'm afraid of it being taken away and, and I'm feeling vulnerable right now because things are being removed or things are being threatened. But according to this verse, what we just spent time walking through in verse five, we are in the safest place we could possibly be and what feels extremely vulnerable, we're in the safest place we could possibly be if we have a relationship with the Lord and are running to that place and that person who is Jesus. And it's a place and a person that causes us to look to the Lord as our shelter, that causes us to say, no, I'm gonna press in so that I can experience a deeper relationship with the Lord. Lord, it's a place that I know that you are gonna one day lift me high upon the rock, that you're gonna do something great through what I'm going through right now. The Lord is working. I promise you he is. The Lord is working. Run to him, talk with him, trust him to use this time that we are all in to make us stronger and raise us up. Let me read one more time, verse five. For he, the Lord, will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Lord, we trust in that, we rely on that, we run to that this morning, Lord. May we memorize that, may that speak to our hearts and lives this week, Lord, that you are always working in the midst of chaos and after it as well. In Jesus' name, amen.